Howdy folks! So you've read the title, and if that's the case, you probably own one of these. This is a CyberPower CP1500 PFC LCD, or it's an uh, identical look-alike, the 1350 VA model. Now, um, these have been in production for probably around a decade or so. Um, I have units dating back all the way to 2011 or so. And uh, from my experience, there are at least three different revisions of this exact model um, out in the wild. Um, this one here, this is a Rev 1 unit. Uh, there's also a Rev 2, which looks very similar, but it does have some minor differences. And then there's a Rev 3, which is the most modern iteration, which has a different front panel, um, and has a color tilting LCD, and, and it's very easy to tell. Um, now, of course, uh, you've read the title, so I'll go right into it. These UPSs, uh, unfortunately, have a... Uh, I don't really want to call it a design flaw. It is, is kind of a manufacturing uh, issue um, surrounding some of the adhesive that's used in here. So uh, to give you a little bit of uh, sort of background, uh, it's very common practice in, if you are a manufacturer of electronic circuit boards um, that if you have any uh, large or heavy uh, components that are off board, so things like electrolytic capacitors or inductors, things like that, it's good practice to uh, glue them down to the board or to each other in order to uh, increase uh, rigidity so that uh, when the uh, whole assembly is, is moved and vibrated, um, it, it prevents um, the leads from bending back and forth, causing um, you know, fatigue um, fractures in the, the leads or in the solder joints. So generally it makes everything more reliable. And uh, it costs companies uh, money to do this because not only do they have to actually buy the adhesive, but they have to pay someone on the assembly line with a glue gun, effectively, to gunk everything down, and that's generally a manual process. I'm not saying it's always manual, but almost always it is still a manual process. So it costs money um, for companies to do this. And generally speaking, the more adhesive you use, the better the product is perceived to be. Um, however, unfortunately, um, the choice of adhesive is kind of important. Um, I've seen everything from sort of the most amateur being literally hot glue, like the same stuff that you used in arts and crafts, all the way up to nice uh, silicone. And those are fine, but there's another adhesive that's um, been commonly used in electronics. Unfortunately, I don't know exactly what it's called or what it's made out of. So if anyone knows exactly what I'm talking about, um, if you actually know, please put it in the comments. I'd love to know what this is actually called. But... I simply refer to it as the yellow glue. Um, basically, it's almost always yellow. It's not always yellow. Um, I, I have seen a couple cases of it being a slightly different color, but 95% of the time it's yellow. So I suspect that's its natural color. And it seems to be a cheap adhesive, and it sticks to a lot of stuff, and it's, it's somewhat compliant, so it's not super rigid. Um, so it works very well for um, you know, that kind of application. However, it has a critical problem. And that is, uh, over time, due to, and I think it is impacted by environmental factors, things like humidity and temperature, uh, eventually it will chemically break down and it will change from a sort of compliant yellow uh, material to a very dark brown, uh, very brittle uh, material that doesn't stick very well to stuff. And that, of course, is, is not great because it doesn't do its job very well, but it has two other attributes that are uh, pretty much death to electronics. One of them is that it becomes corrosive, and the second one is that it becomes electrically conductive. And for a, an adhesive that's just gooped on top of electrical, electronic components, um, the conductive part becomes a serious problem. And all it takes is it to become conductive enough, and you need to have high enough voltage, and you've now got, you know, current flowing where it's not supposed to, um, and things go boom. And so these UPSs use that terrible yellow glue in a couple places, which unfortunately can and has led to failures. So um, just a word of note, uh, this video, this intro, may or may not have been filmed after some of the uh, clips that are about to follow. So I hope that the, the, this is, uh, there's a lot of, uh, con I hope the continuity is, is there. Um, it's not too difficult to follow. This unit um, has already been repaired, uh, but this unit unfortunately uh, suffered 
a uh, an actual blowout on the circuit board. Uh, it had a hole burned in the circuit board uh, in the charge circuit, which t took this unit out, and uh, I was able to repair it and rebuild it. Um, but obviously, it would be nice to not have that happen. So um, I'm making this video kind of as a PSA that if you have one of these units, uh, and I've had I've, I've uh, I have de deployed probably around twelve, probably around a dozen of these things. Um, and between, you know, myself, family, work, etc. And I've probably opened about half of them so far. And they're all Rev 1 and 2 units, and they all have the glue. Some of them have it in different places, um, so I'm not sure whether it was a, a factory employee that was just overzealous with the glue on some of them, or whether they changed their directive as to where it should go. Um, but they all have it to some extent, and there's a couple locations in particular that are uh, a serious problem, or can become a serious problem. Now, I can't tell you when the glue is going to become conductive. It could happen in, in three years after you buy the product. It could happen in ten years after you buy the product. Um, I really don't know uh, enough about the specifics of what makes it go conductive. Not sure whether it absorbs water out of the air or, or whatever. I've had units in very dry and cold climates and ones in very hot and humid climates, and they both, they both have the same problem applied to them, so I really can't say what it is could even be down to the formulation of the glue when it's applied. I honestly don't know. Um, but uh, I would recommend that if you care at all about your investment, um, that you take it apart and that you clean the glue out of it. Uh, it is kind of annoying to do. It's, very, it's pretty easy to take these units apart, and I'll show you how to do that. Uh, but that being said, it's, um, you know, you're going to have to book off probably half an hour to an hour of time um, to, you know, scrape and chip the glue off um, there is a bit of risk in some of the locations because you can take off surface mount components, but if you do it right, um, and, you know, I would recommend you have a soldering iron on, on hand, uh, because there is one, one cable, um, uh, that is pretty easy to break off, and I've done it twice now, um, but again, it's just two wires, it's easy to solder back, um, so, I, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing this if you, uh, if you don't have sort of electronics experience, but uh, if you care about your UPS and you care about the stuff plugged into it, obviously you do because you bought a UPS, um, I would recommend, you know, taking, taking this, this knowledge and, and just, uh, you know, thinking about whether, whether it's worth it. Um, if, if you choose to do nothing, you know, it could, it, your, your unit could work fine um, for, you know, another decade. It could also go up in flames tomorrow. Um, until you check, you won't really know. Um, and because it's down to the location of the glue and how much glue, and since that's a manual process, it varies wildly from unit to unit. So some units may never, even if the glue does go conductive, in some units you will never have a problem. Other units, like some of mine, you will have a problem. Um, so that's, uh, that's the intro to this video. I am going to uh, just sort of uh, tack on all the clips that I filmed, and hopefully it all makes sense. And uh, yeah, this is what the inside of one of these units looks like. And to get these units apart, it's not that difficult. Um, start by taking the battery out. So you take two screws at the bottom, slide the top off, um, pull out the battery pack, disconnect it. Um, to get the rest of it apart, um, there's six screws in the back in these recessed holes. Just pull those out, and then the back will just slide straight off. Um, the top is actually a cover, and so you just slide this back, and then it will uh, lift right off. There's three tabs, one here, here, and here. Push those in, and the top clamshell will separate, and then you just peel it back, and it will eventually uh, snap off on the bottom. It will make a very loud, very scary sound, like you're breaking something, but you're not. There is no way to release the tabs that I'm aware of from the outside, um, and they're very robust, so uh, it doesn't uh, appear to have any problems doing that multiple times on the same unit. Now, I've already deglued and actually repaired this unit, um, but I'll go over the uh, the architecture. It's actually pretty straightforward um, to follow. So, you know, we've got our, our battery input, uh, cap and fuse here. All of our switching stuff uh, takes place on these heat sinks, which are uh, indeed directly connected. Um, we have the chargers down here. So this is the uh, charger transformer and uh, the IC, um, which runs it is this one here. And that this is where the repair uh, I've done is. So you can see I've replaced the fuse with uh, one that's slightly the wrong size, but it's the correct rating, and then there's a big hole in the board that I've had to dremel out to get rid of the uh, the carbon buildup, and then I've had to basically point-to-point -point wire all the components around it. Um, luckily, the chip survived because uh, that's uh, currently weapons-grade unobtainium because of the global chip shortage, so I really didn't want to have to deal with that. Um, but anyway, uh, 
the you know the mains comes in. We've got some filters. Of course, we've got our switching relays, um, some you know noise suppression. Um, the actual controllers up here. It looks like it's just an STM32 chip, um, which does the USB and serial and all of the other control and everything like that. And then there's just some sort of data uh, to the front panel, and I'm not actually sure what that is. If it's UART or Icegrid C or Spy or some kind of bus like that, I, I haven't bothered to probe this at all, um, and I don't think I really really care all that much. And there's a buzzer here, and that's about it. Um, it's it's very straightforward, um, and all of the other protection, you know, is all separate. You know, you've got the Ethernet and the coax, and then there's a circuit breaker here, um, and then the front panel, of course, is just uh, its own separate two boards. Now, as far as the location of the glue goes, uh, it's very inconsistent between the models. I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe there's different factory workers have different ideas of where it should go. Maybe they changed their directives. I'm not really sure. Um, but there's a couple locations that I found it uh, in the units I've taken apart so far. Um, there's a strain relief for the 5 volts that goes to the USB charger. Um, there's uh, this capacitor here. Um, they usually glob it down, and there's a, there's a bunch of surface mount resistors, so be careful with those if you try to remove this one. There's also a glob usually between uh, this cap here and this heat sink down in here, so you probably have to take the board out to clean that one off. Um, they glue these two capacitors down to the board here. Um, that's where it actually arced out in mine, uh, because it's actually a decently high voltage on the input to that switching IC. Um, they'll also glue down the... Um, the, they'll, they'll use this as a strain relief on this NTC here, down on these wires, and that pretty much covers, uh, if I remember correctly, that pretty much covers everything on this board. Um, as far as the front panel goes, they also use it as a strain relief on the other end of that 5 volt wire to this USB board. Um, so to get that out, um, these screws are actually not related, they're actually going to the power button. Um, so there's just uh, a couple tabs here uh, that you have to take out. This plastic cover comes off, you can get to this board, uh, and just clean that off. There is nothing on uh, the actual display board itself, so you don't have to worry about that. And uh, that's those are all the locations I've seen it. Sometimes you'll open a unit and it'll be missing a couple of those, and that'll be great, but those are the places I've seen it. Now, if you need to remove the board for any reason, um, of course, you can just uh, take out this connector, um, take out this wire, take out the zip ties and hold this one on. Um, you'll have to undo these bolts and pull all of the... Uh, uh, spade terminals off. Uh, they don't seem to have any retention clips. They are just really, really tight, so you're going to probably need some pliers to get them off. And um, you're going to have to undo the fan connector, which is here. And the only thing that you're going to have to actually uh, kind of fight with is the actual NTC. Um, the NTC is soldered on this side, and it's siliconed in to a uh, kind of tiny little hole here. So what I did was I just cut the, sil the silicone and sort of lifted it up into this hole. It's actually supposed to be just free floating in this hole to measure the, uh, the ambient air temperature. It's not actually directly coupled to the transformer core. Um, and so I just cut that, lifted it out, and then I just hot glued it back in place um, when I put this back together. You could also uh, desolder it um, from here. I had one unit where I actually was trying to remove the, the glue and it actually just ripped the solder uh, joints completely out. Um, so it kind of came out for me, and then I just soldered it back from the top side. So uh, there's a couple different ways to do it, and then there's just uh, three screws that hold this board on, one, two, and then the third one is over in this corner, and then there's some clips, so I like to undo the clips on this side and then kind of slide it this way and up, and uh, that's how I get this board out. Um, there's really, there's nothing on the back side that you really have to worry about, um, and that's, and then you just do the reverse process to put it all back together. Um, all of the spade terminals are nicely labeled with the color on the board, um, and plus, if you don't really mess with this wire bundle too much, um, they'll all kind of be naturally wanting to sit in the location where they were. Um, the only thing I would make sure is you get the positive and negative course on this correct. Uh, and other than that, it's pretty easy to take this board out and put it back in. Here I have what I call a Rev2 unit, and you can tell because on the bottom, and this is very, very heavy, you can tell because uh, the USB power is rated at uh, 2.1 amps. The other way that you can tell is because there is no uh, green text here um, underneath the model number. Um, and that is uh, an easy way to tell that this is a Rev2. So here's inside a Rev2 unit, and you can see that it's pretty much identical to the Rev1 unit with the addition of this 
added circuit board on top, and that is for the USB charger. So if you take a look down here in this corner of the board, it's a whole bunch of unpopulated components, and that's for the old one amp charger that they designed in the Rev1 boards. You can actually see the header of where um, these, this cable would have connected to, and they've just instead uh, uh, you know, depopped all this stuff and then run the cable up to this board, and there's a whole bunch of uh, through-hole stuff on the bottom, um, which is what supplies that, that 2.1 amp charger. Other than that, uh, everything else appears to be identical with the, uh, the Rev1 units. And that includes, unfortunately, the glue. And uh, I don't know how well this is going to come, come across on camera, um, so I, I, you know, I'm going to try and use this flashlight sparingly here. Uh, but that is kind of the color that the glue is, is sort of supposed to be. It's supposed to be a yellow color. And if you take a look down here um, at uh, this, this capacitor here, at the bottom of that capacitor, um, you can see some glue. And hopefully this comes across on camera as far as the uh, color change goes. Um, on the, the right side, you see that it's more yellow, and on the left-hand side, you can see that it's, uh, it, it's starting to turn brown, and uh, so it looks like we, you know, I got this one uh, sort of just in time. Um, now, I've measured this brown area with my multimeter, and it has not become conductive yet, uh, which is good, uh, because that is, this, this, this exact thing is what will eventually cause a failure. Um, that blob is what caused the failure in the last unit that I actually had to repair um, because uh, that resistor and that diode have a relatively high potential across them, um, and that's uh, that's what caused um, a, you know a carbon tracking and then it, it blew the fuse. So um, this one I have to clean it out from there. There's some on both of those capacitors there, um, of course back up there with the thermistor, and then they've also got some down in there between the uh, the capacitor and the heatsink. Let's see if I can. Yeah, down in there. So I think just to get it all... Now this one realistically is probably not that bad because uh, it doesn't really cover all that much stuff. Um, but I think just for the for completeness, uh, because this is one of my personal units, I'm going to take everything out of here, and uh, including the board, and clean it all. Uh, at least they didn't put any uh, down here on uh, this part, this TO220 and this uh, capacitor, because that's where um, there's a bunch of SMDs that usually get covered, um, and that can be a real pain to clean off uh, without you know, breaking anything. I can also confirm that on the Rev2 units, uh, the USB connector does have glue as a strain relief on the wires. So if you uh, care to, uh, about this, you should uh, definitely remove that as well. If you really don't care, uh, especially if you never use these, you can always just unplug um, this charger from uh, this port here. You can just unplug that cable and then, uh, you know, this is disabled and you never have to worry about it again. So I just thought I'd show you the uh, the underside of this uh, power supply board here and uh, unfortunately it does have glue on it um, as a strain relief here and here um, and what's uh, what I find kinda I, ex I expected but also interesting is that uh, this actually gets its power directly from the mains so uh, it actually has this cable which goes straight over to the bus bars on the rear so this is just a regular effectively this is just like a wall wart um, without the case uh, and although it doesn't appear that this was uh, something that they outsourced. It does appear that CyberPower designed this themselves, though. Um, not only do, do the silks, does the silkscreen, you know, have a, a CP part number, um, but also, um, you know, like you look at all the capacitors, they've standardized with SUSCON capacitors across the board, um, and they've done the same thing here as well. Again, same glue, everything. So this looks like they designed their own power supply, uh, but you could just use this out, you know, as a, as a regular power supply. And that also means that if you uh, if you don't want this sort of, you know, consuming quiescent current um, on a Rev2, all you got to do is just unplug the mains connector right here from this board, and uh, that completely disconnects this um, from power uh, completely. And, uh, of course, I need two hands to do that, but um, that's the easy way to do it. With Rev1, you can't do it because it's built into the board. There's really no way to easily cut the power. But Rev2, you could easily disable this uh, if you wanted to reduce the idle power consumption of your unit if you, you know, buy you know, a fraction of a watt probably, uh, but nonetheless, if you don't want the liability of this running all the time, you can of course just remove it. So there is one other thing to do with these UPSs that I wanted to split out into a separate video, but I actually don't think that's um, worth it, so I'll just include it in uh, this one. And that is, uh, well, I kind of lied about the, other, the differences between the Rev 1 and 2. There is another one, and it's actually the display board. It's actually the biggest difference between the Rev 1 and the 2 other than the charger. Um, it's actually a completely different board um, they respun it and everything. And the version 2, uh, unfortunately, is horrendously unreliable. Um, the backlight is, uh, is a, a, it's a different model, and it's a, 
very, very poor quality LEDs, which eventually fail by either going out completely or they go very, very dim. And so the result is the screen gets really, really dim. Now, they're completely interchangeable. They use the exact same connector and exact same protocol. Um, there's no real intelligence, it's just a display driver. So you can um, swap them between the uh, models if you want. Um, this is one from a Rev2 unit, and uh, of course it's had the, uh, the backlight failure. Uh, and so I wanted to see if I could actually sort of retrofit this and sort of repair it. And so the, uh, what you can do is you can actually peel back the reflective film, and the actual LED board is uh, it's just soldered into these two holes here for the anode and cathode. And you can see uh, each of the SMD LEDs would go into where all those little castellations are. And uh, all three LEDs are in uh, parallel. So, of course, if one of them kind of dies, they all kind of die. Um, they don't, there's no real proper balancing of uh, current between them. They should be matched, but, of course, um, that's not really always the case after a while. Uh, getting this out is the most difficult part of the repair um, because this board is very, very... Uh, flimsy and it uh, it, it basically it, it wants to melt. I mean, I mean I mean I know it can't actually melt, but it it gets very soft um, when heated up. And getting the tabs out is very difficult. It's not like a normal lead. It's actually a tab where the board goes through the other board, and it's very very big pain in the ass to get out. So anyway, this LED here is the working one. The other two LEDs have failed. Um, so what I did, um, and this is the first time I'm doing this is I took a, uh, a backlight from another display. This is from an old automotive display. I have a whole bunch of these um, from a project a long time ago, and I have no use for them anymore. And uh, so I, I took out the LED strip, and of course it had a bunch of LEDs here, and I've desoldered a couple of them, so I just have a little pile of these things here. These are, of course, white LEDs, which is what uh, this originally had. However, these are right angle, uh, and they're a little bit larger pin pitch. And so what I've done is I've retrofitted the center one here, um, so it's actually firing down towards, um, you know, towards the the uh, diffuser on the back. Um, but it does work, and it's got the same forward voltage as the other original LED. I don't think I'm going to replace the original because I'm just going to leave it where it is. I'm going to do the other one, and then I'm just going to put this back in there. Um, and the color temperature is slightly off. This one's slightly cooler than the one I'm putting in, but no one is ever going to notice or care. All that matters is that you can actually see the, um, the uh, display. Um, and as far as for compliance voltage, it's not a big deal. Um, they're actually deriving the backlight from the 12 volt supply that comes to this board. Um, they've you got five resistors in parallel, um, which is on the Rev 1 boards, it's 200 ohms equivalent resistance, and on the uh, Rev 2 boards, which this one is, it's equivalent 320 ohms resistance. Um, so you've got a high compliance voltage there, so you really, uh, you know, if you had to tweak the uh, the resistance, it's, it's very easy to do to get it to work with pretty much any LED. Or if you had another strip that was a series strip, you could easily put it in there and then just adjust the resistors um, uh, accordingly. So having that uh, high compliance voltage is really quite nice. But I'm just going to go with this approach because um, I couldn't find any better LEDs. Unfortunately, I don't stock any uh, of these little tiny surface mount uh, LEDs in, in white, um, like bright white. Um, I have you know indicator LEDs like green and stuff like that, but those won't work for this. Um, and I did not want to make an order uh, just for these LEDs. So I'm going to uh, try this out and we'll see uh, how it looks. So I have successfully replaced the two LEDs, and uh, this is it just running off of my bench top power supply here. So you can see they're all about equal brightness. So uh, it's time to try and reassemble this and see how it looks. Here it is, all, well, sort of, back together again. So here is the repaired PCB. You can see, uh, well, that uh, I haven't put the uh, reflective tape all the way back yet, but it is, uh, even with it kind of open like that, the display is nice and bright and fully legible, even in a room with lights on, which is not to you know not the way it was before. Um, and I see if I can turn this off to show you what it ultimately ended up looking like. Of course, I'm reaching here for the power button. The power button's on this board, and you have to hold this thing for quite a while for it to actually shut down. Here we go. So, unfortunately, well, the, like I said, this board is pretty pretty terrible. Um, I actually had to build my own lead on this side. Um, I found that it was easier to just cut off the tab of this board 
Um, and I just put a, a, a random piece of wire from one of the pads of this LED uh, down to the the pad on uh, the the pad on this side. So even though it's a, a plated through hole, because it's plated, I just have to basically make contact with the pad on this side. And this this tab survived, so it's actually connected through all on this side. Um, but yeah, that's it. So I'm just gonna uh, basically tape all this back up. And uh, you, you don't even have to really do that because the case itself is not um, it's not transparent. Um, the only thing you're really trying to protect against is light leaking around this window here. Um, but anyway, a little bit of electrical tape um, will seal that up nicely, and uh, I'll be able to put this back together. So I, uh, you know, if you have a dim LCD, you know that is the repair. That's the uh, amount of effort you're going to have to go to to uh, re replace it um, or repair it. Um, obviously, I don't recommend using right angle LEDs like this, but they do work perfectly fine. Um, but uh, I mean, I, now that I've done this, I probably wouldn't recommend you do this um, unless you have a lot of uh, experience. Um, sort of doing uh, soldering and repairs and stuff. It's, uh, it's not very easy, um, even for myself, I found this to be quite difficult, um, especially with uh, you know, the fact that these LEDs are all relatively low temp and it's uh, very easy to melt them. Um, so you know, if you don't have the right tools, um, you, you've got to be pretty quick with uh, what you're doing or otherwise uh, you'll end up melting the LEDs. So make sure you have more than uh, what, you're, what you're planning on using before you start. And here it is in its glory, all fully assembled, and it looks just like a, uh, a V1 unit or a Rev2 that hasn't died yet. For comparison, for comparison, here is a Rev1 unit that uh, has a fully normal display, and as you can see, it looks pretty much identical, um, both on camera and in real life, so um, I'm pretty happy with the repair.